Bentham's utilitarianism is nothing if it's not perfectly consistent. And as we'll see when we come to our debates, it can, through the rigorous application of its logic, lead to some perhaps unsettling conclusions. And we'll see why this is so in the thought of John Stuart Mill, a figure who represents the finest expression of British utilitarianism in the 19th century. And it's no accident that Mill would become the most able exponent of utilitarian philosophy because he was raised from the time he was in the cradle to become a utilitarian philosopher. Mill had very little choice in the matter. His father, James Mill, was an acolyte, a defender, and an ally of Bentham, close friends with Bentham, and lifelong ally in their political and philosophical struggles. And James Mill's son, John, was raised from the crib to believe in utilitarianism. And he would. He would come to embrace and to articulate the utilitarian philosophy. Of course, there's a story of how this would, at times, come to depress him, particularly in the middle of his life, and he would see it as an arid and almost inhuman, unrealistic way of looking at all of life, trying to measure everything in terms of pleasure and pain. But nevertheless, he would certainly become reconciled and would deepen utilitarianism to the point that we have to ask if it is even still fundamentally Benthamite utilitarianism. Mill's utilitarianism builds on Bentham's and says that the foundation of utilitarianism is the greatest happiness principle, that that act or that law is just which produces the greatest happiness in the greatest numbers. But Mill, who's one of the great economic and one of the great political thinkers of the mid-19th century, would try to refine many of the coarser aspects of Bentham's utilitarianism. And take just one example, the nature of pleasure. For Bentham, all pleasure is the same. For Bentham, all pleasure is sensational. All pleasure is something physical. It's a physical experience of pleasure, of well-being. And for Bentham, the measure of the pleasures is fundamentally quantitative. And so Bentham's utilitarianism is a purely quantitative utilitarianism. The greatest amount of pleasure is what justifies an act. And so Bentham doesn't distinguish between various types of pleasure. Mill sees this as problematic, and he sees that this leads to unsettling conclusions, because for Bentham, all pleasure is pleasure. Two units of pleasure are the same. Five units of pleasure is the same as five units of pleasure. And it doesn't matter in what those consist. And so whether it's reading a play of Shakespeare or sitting around and drinking a Bud Light and yelling at a basketball team, for Bentham, there's no way to distinguish. But this bothers John Mill. And indeed, it's a profound problem in Bentham's utilitarianism because it can't distinguish what would seem intuitively to us, perhaps, to be different kinds of pleasures. And so you have to decide if you're a utilitarian. Am I going to be a utilitarian on the model of Bentham? And I don't judge whether you get those pleasures from a beautiful symphony or from the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation. I don't care. I can't judge. All pleasures are equal. Mill's utilitarianism argues instead that there are differences of kind in our achievement of pleasure. In other words, there are qualitatively different pleasures, that all pleasures aren't of equal units, that there aren't two units of pleasure here and two units of pleasure there, that there are, in fact, as he says, higher and lower pleasures, that there are some pleasures that are, we might say, more refined, and others that are less, that are lower, that appeal to our baser instincts. And so for Mill, there are intellectual pleasures, which are higher pleasures, and there are lower pleasures, which are tied to our appetites, closer to our baser bodily needs. And so Mill will say there is a difference between reading a play of Shakespeare and watching fake wrestling. And 
for Mill, one is a kind of intellectual pleasure and one is a kind of bodily, basal pleasure. And for Mill, we can say that qualitatively, one is superior to the other. And so Mill wants to say that all that matters in the calculus is the balance of pleasure and pain, but that some pleasures are better than others. And so his rule for this, which you have to decide if you find this intuitively plausible, is that imagine someone who has experienced both kinds of pleasures. So one person has gone to a performance of a beautiful Beethoven symphony and the next night goes, happens to go to watch Hulk Hogan wrestle. Somebody who's experienced both, he says, will always tell you which is the higher. And so it's not simply a prejudice. It's not simply your cultural elitism that says that the Beethoven symphony is a kind of higher pleasure, but rather it is the truth, that there is something qualitatively different in that kind of intellectual pleasure. Well, how can this be? Mill argues that humans have certain natural capacities and that humans experience a kind of higher pleasure when they fully develop and experience and use those capacities, capacities like reason. And so for Mill, there's a sense in which some pleasures are achieved through the fulfillment of our nature. And in particular, it is those pleasures which are achieved through the fulfillment of the highest aspects of our nature, that which most separates us from animals and other creatures that are the higher pleasures. Now, to some, that may sound familiar. It's been said that this represents a way of letting Aristotle in through the back door because it envisions man not simply as a machine that seeks pleasure and avoids pain, but as a particular kind of creature that is endowed with certain capabilities and that the fulfillment of pleasures through those capabilities is the fulfillment of our nature and in a way is an achievement of a kind of set of higher pleasures. And so Mill's version of utilitarianism represents a certain kind of fulfillment of Bentham's calculus, but at the same time represents a betrayal of the fundamental idea that all pleasures are the same.